as SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket sent a suite of classified U.S. Space Force payloads into a geostationary orbit from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center on November 1. The mission, dubbed USSF-44, was the vehicle's first national security space launch mission, its fourth flight since 2018, and the first in more than three years. A Falcon Heavy is basically three Falcon 9 boosters strapped together with 27 Merlin engines powering the first stage and one engine in the second stage. The second stage of the USS F-44 mission featured a gray band to increase the amount of heat absorbed from the sun during the prolonged coasting period and warm the fuel tank. When it gets too cold, the fuel, RP-1, becomes viscous and slushy. If ingested, the slushy fuel would likely prevent ignition or destroy the upper stage's Merlin engine. About two and a half minutes after liftoff, the launch vehicle's two side boosters separated and performed synchronized boost back burns to begin their return flight to Earth. Both boosters landed back at SpaceX's landing zones 1 and 2 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station about eight and a half minutes after liftoff, marking the company's 150th and 151st successful recoveries. The core stage of the rocket separated from the second stage just over four minutes after liftoff and was jettisoned into the Atlantic Ocean as the mission's performance requirements did not allow enough fuel to return and land the stage back on a drone ship. The center core was likely destroyed when it re-entered Earth's atmosphere. The mission flew two main payloads into a 36,000-kilometer geostationary orbit. One is a classified satellite called the Shepard Demonstration Satellite, and the other is the Long Duration Propulsive ESPA, a spacecraft bus hosting six payloads. Because of the classified nature of the mission, the webcast ended before payload separation from the upper stage. The Space Systems Command tweeted on Tuesday evening that the mission was successful and the payloads had entered their designated orbits. The next Falcon Heavy mission is scheduled for January 4, 2023. The Viasat-3 and Arcturus satellites, both designed to deliver high-speed satellite broadband services, will be placed in a geostationary orbit during that mission. Roughly two days after the USS F-44 mission, SpaceX conducted its 51st launch of the year with a flight-proven Falcon 9 rocket, sending a Hotbird 13G telecommunication satellite into a geostationary transfer orbit. The Falcon 9's first stage returned to Earth a little less than nine minutes later, landing on a drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. It was the seventh launch and landing for this particular booster. Hotbird 13G, meanwhile, continued to soar atop the Falcon 9's upper stage, which deployed the satellite into geosynchronous transfer orbit about 36 minutes after liftoff. Over the next few months, the satellite will use its electric propulsion to raise itself into a 36,000 km geostationary orbit. The Hotbird 13G satellite will join its twin, the Hotbird 13F satellite, launched in October by another Falcon rocket. The Hotbird satellite family forms one of the largest broadcasting systems in Europe, delivering 1,000 television channels to more than 160 million TV homes in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. The next Falcon 9 mission is scheduled for November 8, which will carry Galaxy 31 and Galaxy 32 communications satellites into orbit. The third and final lab module docked with China's Changong Space Station on October 31, completing the construction of the country's crude orbital outpost. The module, called Mengtian Lab Module, was launched into Earth orbit atop a Long March 5B rocket from Wenchang Satellite Launch Center on October 31. Nearly 13 hours after launch, the module docked with the front port of the Changong Space Station, orbiting the Earth at an altitude of about 380 kilometers. The crew of three astronauts comprising the Shenzhou-14 mission watched events from aboard the space station. With a mass of 23,000 kilograms, a length of 17.9 meters, and a diameter of 4.2 meters, Mentian will provide space for science experiments in zero gravity, an airlock for exposure to the vacuum of space, and a small robotic arm to support extravehicular payloads. Stowed on the outside of the service module, there are solar arrays that are flexible and deployable. Hours after docking, the Mentian module was relocated to its permanent position, and the three modules, Tianko, Wentian, and Mentian, formed the basic T-shaped structure of the Jiangong Space Station. The station's core module, called Tianko, went into space in April 2021. In July this year, China launched the Wentian Lab module, which then docked with the core module. Tiangong, meaning palace in the sky, is now one of two space stations currently orbiting the Earth, the other being the International Space Station. With a mass of about 100,000 kilograms, Tiangong is about a quarter the size of the ISS. China plans to keep Tiangong occupied for at least 10 years, conducting science experiments and eventually hosting foreign astronauts.
The space station will also support a powerful survey space telescope named Shunqian that China plans to launch as soon as late 2023. While China is celebrating the successful launch of Mendian, the 21-ton core stage of the Long March 5B rocket, which launched the module into orbit, tumbled back to Earth on Friday during an uncontrolled re-entry. The U.S. Space Command confirmed pieces of the rocket splashed down in two areas of the Pacific Ocean early Friday morning. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson condemned the People's Republic of China for the re-entry, calling it an unnecessary risk. This is the fourth time since May 2020 that debris from a Chinese rocket has fallen back down and landed on Earth. Fortunately, no one was injured in those incidents. Ahead of its historic lunar mission, on November 4, NASA rolled out the Space Launch System rocket and the Orion spacecraft to Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39B. Following the last rollback to the Vehicle Assembly Building on September 26 to shelter from Hurricane Ian, the rocket has been undergoing testing and maintenance by NASA engineers. Testing of the reaction control system on the solid rocket boosters and the installation of the flight batteries is now complete and those components are ready for flight. Engineers have also replaced the batteries on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. Moreover, minor repairs identified through detailed inspections are also completed. The Artemis 1 mission will lift off from Pad 39B on November 14 during a 69-minute long launch window that opens at 5.07 a.m. UTC. NASA has also secured backup launch dates of November 16 and 19. If the vehicle does not launch by November 19, there is an opportunity to make a fourth attempt on November 25, but it would require a series of discussions that need to occur with the FAA. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX continues the pre-launch tests of Starship 24 and Super Heavy Booster 7 at Starbase. On Monday, October 31, SpaceX resumed the full-stack cryo-proof test by filling the oxygen tank of Booster 7 with subcooled liquid nitrogen. The tank was filled to about 20% of its total capacity, which is equal to 560 tons. The Starship quick disconnect mechanism was disconnected and reconnected to Ship 24 during the test, while cryo-fluid leaked through the ports. This mimics the retraction of the QD arm from a rocket just after engine ignition and right before liftoff. The tank filling and draining operation lasted for about 100 minutes. The next day, on November 1, Starship 25, which has been standing atop suborbital pad A for the past two weeks, underwent its first ever cryoproof test. Subcooled liquid nitrogen was pumped into the oxygen tank of Ship 25 during the test, and frequent venting of cryofluid were observed. Two hours after the frost was first observed on the oxygen tank, SpaceX began filling the methane tank of the ship with subcooled liquid nitrogen. The tank was filled to almost 25% of its total capacity, which is approximately equal to 50 tons. Venting was also observed from the header tanks of the ship during Tuesday's test, indicating that the header tanks were also filled with liquid nitrogen. The Ship 25 propellant tank filling and draining operation lasted more than four hours. Ship 25 cryoproof testing resumed on Wednesday morning, and it was one of the lengthy cryoproof tests ever conducted at Starbase. Filling the ship's oxygen tank with liquid nitrogen began at 11.40 a.m. local time, and the tank was completely filled in two hours. The tank was maintained in that state for the next one and a half hours, during which time the six hydraulic rams installed under the pad simulated the thrust of six Raptor engines by mechanically stressing the ship's thrust structure. This is evident by the ice falling from the surface of the ship. At around 3.15 p.m. local time, methane tank filling began, and within 30 minutes, half of the tank was filled with liquid nitrogen. The methane and oxygen tanks were then slowly drained, concluding the cryoproof test that went for about six and a half hours. Last week's test campaign ended with a full-stack cryoproof test on November 3. Liquid nitrogen was pumped into the methane tanks of both Ship 24 and Booster 7 on Thursday afternoon. Ship 24's methane tank was filled to 25% of its total capacity, and Booster 7's methane tank was filled to 50% of its total capacity during the test. The process of filling and emptying the tank lasted for about 100 minutes. Hours later, SpaceX began filling the oxygen tanks of both prototypes with liquid nitrogen. Ship 24's oxygen tank was filled to 25% of its total capacity, and Booster 7's oxygen tank was filled to 50% of its total capacity during the test. This test also lasted for about 100 minutes. The road closure notice suggests that full stack and Ship 25 tests will resume next week. In a subcommittee meeting of the NASA Advisory Council on October 31, Mark Kirisich, the NASA Deputy Associate Administrator for the Artemis campaign development, praised SpaceX's advancement on Starship. 
In 2021, NASA awarded SpaceX a $2.9 billion contract to build a modified version of Starship as a lunar lander for its upcoming Artemis III mission. During the subcommittee meeting, Mark Kirisich said that SpaceX has done very well in working toward the development of the lunar lander variant of the Starship. He added that it'd take 12 to 18 hours for a Starship with two crew to get down to the lunar surface after undocking from Orion spacecraft on Artemis III. The crew will spend six days on the lunar surface, and it will take Starship another 12 to 18 hours to get them back up to Orion orbiting the moon. The other two crew members will remain on Orion the whole time. Kirisic said SpaceX is presently targeting early December for the Starship orbital flight test, although this timeline is dependent upon a number of factors, including a full wet dress rehearsal, 33-engine static fire test of Super Heavy, an FAA launch license, and final preparation of ground systems at Starbase launch facility. According to an FAA spokesperson, the agency would determine whether to grant SpaceX a license only after the company provides all outstanding information and FAA can fully analyze it. So, in short, SpaceX should successfully complete all those milestones in the next few weeks to be able to launch Ship 24 and Booster 7 in early December. The profile for that test flight would be the same as the company previously detailed in regulatory filings. After lifting off from Starbase, the booster and ship would separate from each other, and the booster would splash into the Gulf of Mexico, and the Starship would go into orbit. After completing less than one orbit in 90 minutes, the orbital Starship spacecraft would re-enter Earth's atmosphere and splash down near Hawaii. After this initial test flight, SpaceX will focus on the second orbital mission, which will demonstrate Starship-to-Starship -starship propellant transfer. The third Starship orbital flight will be a longer duration mission to mimic the in-space time of a lunar mission, and the fourth mission will be an uncrewed lunar landing demonstration mission scheduled for late 2024. Only after all these four missions are successfully completed will it be clear when we should expect a crewed mission to the lunar surface. So, it is quite possible that all the plans will be adjusted more than once. Kirisic showed a slide displaying the human landing system status during the subcommittee meeting and said that two of NASA's biggest technological development concerns were the new Raptor rocket engine and the transfer and storage of propellants in orbit. He added that SpaceX is building one of its next-generation Raptor version 2 engines every day. Regarding production volume, Musk has previously said that the company's goal is to manufacture roughly 800 to 1,000 engines per year. Recently SpaceX revealed that the SpaceX Raptor team has completed the production of the 200th Raptor version 2 engine. According to a slide that outlines the remaining path to orbital flight, the 33-engine static fire test of Booster 7 will happen after a D-stack, meaning, to reduce risk, Ship 24 will not be present on top of the booster during the 33-engine test. Now, let's return to Starbase. SpaceX rolled back Super Heavy Booster 8 from the launch site to the build site on Monday morning. The prototype, which had not undergone any kind of ground tests to date, was later moved to a display stand at the build site. So it is now clear that SpaceX will not fly Booster 8, and its successor, Booster 9, a much more advanced vehicle, will take flight after Booster 7. Booster 9 was completely stacked inside the wide bay lately, and teams have already installed all four chines on it. The chines are intended to increase the aerodynamic stability of super heavy boosters during atmospheric re-entry. The aft dome section of Ship 26 was moved into the high bay on October 29. It was joined with the liquid oxygen tank section three days later. The primary structure of Ship 26 will be completed with one more stacking operation. At the launch site, teams have begun groundwork for Starbase's second Starship launch tower. A soil mound for the launch tower can be seen in this aerial shot captured by RGV aerial photography. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.